Praise be Jesus and Mary. And now and forever. When God willed to become man, he had to choose the time of his coming. He had to choose the country in which he would be born, the city he would grow up in. He had to choose the political and ec economic systems which would surround him. He had to choose the language he was to speak, etc., etc. All these factors hinged on one thing and one thing only, on the woman that he willed to become his mother. When God willed to come into this world, he willed to come through one person and one person only, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So when the, when the church celebrates the feast of the birth of Our Lady, she celebrates it as the dawn of salvation. This feast is the dawn of our salvation because this is just not any other birth. It is the birth of the one who is to become the mother of God. In his providence, God did not reveal the details of the birth, surrounding the birth of Our Lady. But through faith and reason, we know it is sufficient, and we know a whole lot. Here are two principles. Here's the first one. The Marian doctor, Blessed John Den Scotus, says, if it doesn't go against the authority of the church or against sacred scripture, it is always fitting to attribute to Mary that which is most excellent. That's a general principle. Now here's a particular principle. In Mariology, it's called the principle of eminence, and it goes like this. All the perfections that God has granted, all the perfections and all the graces that God has granted to his saints or to any other creature should be attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary in some manner. Here are three ways to do that. Either through the same form, either through an equivalent way, or in an eminent way. Let me just repeat that. All perfections that God has granted to his saints or to any other creature should be attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary in some manner, either in the same form, in an equivalent way, or in an eminent way. Because above her is only God. Everyone else, and she is everyone else is inferior to her, right? So if God grants graces to those who are inferior to her, it also must be attributed to Our Lady in some manner. Now let's apply that to the birth of Our Lady. We know in the lives of the saints, there have been many prodigious graces that have been granted to them, right? Surrounding their birth. Here's two examples. One is Saint Dominic. So if you remember, just before the birth of St. Dominic, his mother had a prophetic vision of who the child would be. She saw a dog with a torch in its mouth and lighting the world on fire. It was a prophetic vision of who St. Dominic would become, the founder of the Dominicans, in Latin, Domini Canes, the hounds of the Lord, would preach the truth and ignite hearts on fire for the love of God. That's one example. Another example is the life of St. Ambrose. 
the patron of bees. Why? Because it's, it's been said that after his birth, a swarm of bees settled on his face, left, uh, left a drop of honey on his lips as a prophetic sign that he would be the honey-tongued preacher that he would become, right? Go back to our principle. All perfections and graces that have been granted to the saints should be attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary in some manner. Okay. So does that mean that a swarm of bees hovered around Our Lady's face? Not necessarily. Not necessarily the same form of grace, right? How about the second one? We should attribute the graces that the saints receive in an equivalent way. This, most certainly. Those were singular graces and singular signs that will reveal the identity and the mission of that particular saint. Our ladies, Our Lady definitely had this. The prophecies, the types, the symbols, the figures in the Old Testament all pointed to who and what mission Our Lady would have. So she had singular signs also before her birth. Okay. How about, how about um, the, other, the other singular signs, right? We can also attribute to her the eminent, in an eminent way, these graces. Because the birth of these saints were the birth of those who were conceived in sin. But the birth of Our Lady is the birth of her who was conceived without any stain of sin. While the saints were redeemed in a liberative way, Our Lady was redeemed in a preservative way. And what does that mean? That means this. It means that the initial grace of this infant, the initial grace, state of grace, has already surpassed in an eminent way the grace of all the saints and angels combined in their final state. Our Lady surpasses them in an eminent way. De Maria numquam satis, as St. Bernard would say, of Mary, we can truly never say enough. And faith and reason alone give us so much to meditate on, so much to contemplate on. And on this feast in particular, let us unite our Magnificat to Our Ladies, thanking God the Almighty, who has done great things for her. Thanking God, who has done great things for us, because this child, who will become the mother of God, will also become our mother as well. Praise be Jesus and Mary.